Your destiny is one with Aquilonia. Gigantic happenings are forming in the web and the womb of fate, and a blood-mad sorcerer shall not stand in the path of imperial destiny. Welcome back to the Rain of Books podcast. We're on episode number 14. I'm John Keel, joining you from the War Room. My co-host is Josh Preston, as usual, joining you from the Hyrule Cube. Uh, like I said, we are on episode number 14. We are going over Conan the Barbarian, the original works. I was extremely surprised at how, uh, how well the writing is. And hey, I forgot to introduce our podcast. This is the Reign of Books. This is the reader's entry into great narratives where the written page reigns supreme all the time, always. And Josh, uh, how are you doing today? Hey, John, I'm doing good. And today's show, John, is bought, brought to us by Hyborosity, the only way to see Hyboria. Travel from the hostile western lands of the Savage Picts, where you'll definitely want to bring a sword, axe, or any magic you have at home. Then cross the inland sea all the way to the eastern shores, where if you don't become enslaved, let us know how you liked it. Take a sea tour of the spot where Atlantis went down, and then ride by the ancient civilization's new home in the savage inland and see them clawing their way back to the top of the evolutionary chain after some pretty tough centuries as savages swinging through the jungles and clubbing the brains of the rival picked clans. And don't miss on one of our exotic southern scenic tours of Stygia, where there are beauties to behold and pleasures that are renowned worldwide. But be careful, getting in a tussle with the wizard here will make you wish that the Hyconians had given you a nice new home in chains working their minds. Hyborosity's Arctic North trips are for those looking for special adventure. Trek through the ice drifts that will have you guessing on the return journey which way you actually came. Fight prehistoric monsters and meet some of the fierce locals who we actually don't know much about since all of Hyborosity's vacationers who booked this trip have never actually come back. Disclaimer, we have no tour guides, no refunds, no accurate maps due to shifting continents, and no available weeks where wars are not being waged across the continent. Good luck out there. <laughs> and John, let's start off with the news. We thank Hyborosity for its sponsorship of the Reign of Books podcast. And before we start... The actual original warrior, survivor, reaver, that is Conan. Let's talk about some news segments. The first news segment is actually about the godfather of wearable technology. This is Meet the Godfather. Alan, his name is Alex Pentland. This is from The Verge. This is not about a science fiction book. This is about science fiction actually becoming reality in our lifetime, John. So basically, wearable technology, if anyone has not read of Google Glass... Basically, Google it right now. Google Glass is going to be a consumer wearable technology where you put frames on your face and you have a little display in your eyeball. So this, this is crazy. We have you know smartphones. Why do we need to actually wear computers? But these things have been researched for decades. And Alex Pentland has actually uh, tutored a lot of the superstars of wearable technology. So when Google Glass comes out, if it flames out fast and is not adopted, um, it'll still lead the way for other consumer technology, I think. And they talked about Alex Pentland, and the reason I'm bringing this story to the podcast is because we just finished Hyperion, where in the future you had this technology where people could instantaneously access their version of the Internet. You basically offloaded a lot of your memory, and you didn't need to know anything because you could, quote-unquote, Google it in Hyperion. You could access any information in the World Wide Web, which is what they called their world, the web. So with Alex Pentland's technology, he argues that people don't become um, less smart. They don't sit here and dumb down their knowledge. They actually are happier socially. It's like I can remember your kid, so um, your kid's name, rather. So it's like uh, you don't say, oh, hi, Joe. So his, his new technology is called the socio, um, sociometer, I believe. But basically the sociometer not just accesses information, that you would offload onto a computer. It actually measures your breathing rate, uh, what other people are nearby that have the same device. It measures you know, your pulse, your uh, heart rate, other, other, other metrics on your body, and it can tell if you're happy, you're sad, not, without even listening to a word. So the sociometer, uh, just like it sounds, 
will be able to measure everything that you're doing and you know it can supposedly help you know help you in many different ways like I said um, well I gave you a different a different example of accessing information through maybe another piece of wearable technology um, but this one can can measure if you're sad maybe people can intervene if you're sad but there are dangers um, for privacy if people know every every um, bit of your mood or whatnot so there's a long long article in the verge talking about three or four decades of this genius's work and about his his uh, basically his lifelong career toward wearable technologies when back in the 70s people thought he was crazy and now we actually see it come to fruition so it's a pretty interesting read not sure if uh, in our life if in our lifetime we're gonna you know use it regularly but certainly our kids are gonna have to face this type of stuff yeah um, hey there uh, 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 Josh Josh and then you know I'm gonna be complaining that my Google Glass model doesn't have a fast enough processor because you could tell I didn't remember your name you know <clears throat> that's all that's true that's true <laughs> man it'll be like the 1980s computers it'll be like oh what's that screen no yeah we'll, we'll have a combination of slow processors and too many screens on our little tiny display the next story Oyster now counts 500,000 books in its subscription collection. Oyster is the Netflix of ebooks. So basically, we're huge ebook fans. And if you want to actually uh, read voraciously and move faster than we do on our podcast, read four or five books in a week, which uh, I have found out some people do, can binge and do have the time to do that, then, uh, Net, then Oyster actually has 500,000 books to subscribe from. I, after reading this story on Galley Cat, John, I actually went and got a 30-day subscription trial, and I checked it out. Beautifully curated, just like anything you'd expect uh, in, today, in today's competitive market to have a beautiful curated, tons of thumbnails, lots of genres, and I went to the sci-fi and fantasy genre, and I explored it, quote-unquote. That's how they, they made you navigate their website, because my gripe was you could not search anything. So I actually had to actually go look at what they had curated, and I happened across Dan Simmons. He, um, not any of the Hyperion books, but some of his later works separate. Um, I can't remember the names of them. It starts with an I. So any Dan, <laughs> we're huge Dan Simmons fans. We should know his whole library. But there were some other ones, Lord of the Rings, and that's about the extent of what I can tell you that I, I would have immediately put on my reading list. So I was very happy to see this huge you know, service that I didn't know existed, but basically no search engine. So I was immediately, immediately like, um, I guess suspicious. They don't want you searching the library because I bet you out of the 500,000 books that they just got, um, cause they, they, they skyrocketed from, I think 300,000 or hundred thousand titles just a few months back, according to the story. So a little suspicious, but still very cool service. I wonder if that lack of, of, uh, a search feature is part of their deal to have to legally have all of those books available for their service. That's a good point. Um, you know, like I said, Hyperion was not Dan Simmons' uh, seminal work. Hyperion was not on the list, so maybe with those deals, you're right. You can't admit, you know search engines. I never thought about that. I wonder if any other, if there are any other services like that. It's a, it's a matter of uh, natural discovery, or or basically like any other website. What's on the storefront? It's like iTunes, you know. If you have uh, the featured podcast or featured um, book, it's like that you get prime real estate, and they might have the same deal. That's a good point. All right, moving on to our last story, and uh, honoring our mothers. Uh, we have Mother's Day coming up. Uh, this is literature's most horrifying mothers, and uh, boy, I can't think of a better way to honor our mothers <laughs> who might be listening on this podcast. Um, I'm only going to cover a few of these. This is coming from uh, oysterbooks.com, the blog there. Uh, the first one is uh, Grendel's mother. Uh, she gets the scariest mother award on the blog here. I think that's a great pick. Uh, the next one is... I pick Angelina Jolie for anything, any award. <laughs> any award at all? That's kind of not fair to call her a terrible mother because the, the picture here on the blog is, is the Angelina Jolie character from the the new the most recent Beowulf movie, uh, which I'm, I'm a big fan of, by the way. I like that movie a lot. A lot of people didn't, and I did, so go ahead and hate me now. Uh, the Evil Queen in uh, Snowdrop uh, from the Grimm's Fairy Tales um, because she would, uh, she'd she'd rather eat her kids' organs than have her daughters be more beautiful than her. Oh, that's pretty awesome. You know, whatever. Great mom. Great mom. 
That's good stuff right there. I'm going to scroll on down real quick here. Oh, here you go. Scarlett O'Hara, uh, most, mar- most narcissistic <laughs> mother. Uh, mother of three and gone with the wind, uh, but uh, you don't really ever hear her talk about her kids in the whole movie. It's a lot of herself. And uh, let's see here. Last one, Mrs. Bennett. Uh, they call her the most nettlesome mother, and this is from Pride and Prejudice. And uh, frankly, uh, any mother character in Pride and Prejudice just goes ahead and gets the thumbs down from me. Uh, so anyway, that's it, Josh. Uh, Shout out to the mothers. Moms. Feel honored. Happy yes. Day. <laughs> All right. Hey, and moving on into our story, uh, Conan the Barbarian. I wanted to give everyone a quick, quick background. Uh, on the stories that we're about to discuss. These are the original Conan stories written by Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan. And I didn't realize this until we started reading. These were written in the 1930s. I really thought Conan was more recent. I'd always pictured Conan as some development of the 60s and 70s. It, it, when, when I think of Conan, at least being at the age I'm at, I think of, I think of you know, something that came out in a comic book in the 60s and 70s. That's really not the case. And when I read these books, I was really surprised at how well written they are. I mean, this guy really put a lot of thought into his story, and we'll talk about that. But but just for some background, it's Robert E. Howard's the author. I already said they were written in the 30s. They were published originally, I, I think it was called Strange Tales Magazine. Um, the original works are considered critically as very high quality uh, writing, but after Robert E. Howard died, a lot of the fans started to take over his his works. I guess there was nothing, um, I, th- th- there was there was no copyright that was, you know, keeping keeping this fan fiction from happening, or there was no publishing house that said, no, we own the rights to this. So the, people were taking this and just running amok with it, and they, they, wanted, they wanted to add to the lore, and, and their intentions were good, and this is called Posthumous collaboration. Um, they were they were trying to add to the lore. They were trying to write their own stories about Conan. And um, ultimately, what happened uh, is that some of his original works ended up being rewritten and then republished um, by less than reputable authors. And uh, less than reputable people were actually developing the lore um, or developing the story of Conan uh, outside of any kind of guidance. Uh, so uh, the the and this is all coming from from the uh, uh, the note section of this this collaboration of Conan stories that I purchased for this particular podcast, but it, it said when a character takes off like this, and you see it a lot in Hollywood, that it really takes on a life of its own, and I, and I would absolutely agree with that. Um, you, you really see that happen with a lot of stuff, and certainly with the Conan movies that have come out and all the comic books, it really... It really went beyond uh, what Howard originally wanted. Something else that happened in these uh, the, the fan writings um, is that the works were reordered. Now, Robert Howard, when he wrote these, there is no particular order. The first book we start off in, Conan as a king. Um, he, he, he's, already, he's already killed another king and taken his throne. Well, it's kind of an odd place to start, but Howard said... I'm not writing a story about Conan as much as I'm chronicling his adventure. So Howard wanted you to get the feel that Conan's sitting in front of him and he's just telling stories as they come to his mind. And Howard's, you know, quickly trying to scribble them down and just chronicling the adventures of Conan. And when he died, the fans took that and tried to put all the stories in order so everything's chronological. And that's really not the way it was intended. I... I don't know why I found that so interesting, uh, that he really didn't want it to be that way, and he was able to put that out before he died. Last couple points I want to make here is that I learned from, from reading the, the beginning notes, H.P. Lovecraft was a huge fan of Robert E. Howard, and that's a big deal because why would someone like H.P. Lovecraft be a big fan? And after reading the books, I understand. Robert E. Howard has some creepy stuff in his stories, some stuff that Hollywood has yet to capture in, in any kind of movies, um, Conan went to some very dark places, and these were some very gory encounters that he had. Um, but uh, Lovecraft really got into Howard's works, and he, he commented on something Howard had done. Um, in his stories, Howard tried to pick names that we would automatically associate certain things with. So, like the name of a character, and I don't really have a good example for you, but his intent was, I give this character this name, and readers are familiar with the way that name sounds or the connotation of that name, so I can automatically help the reader identify in a very short story that this guy is evil. When you hear his name, you automatically know that he's evil, right? Or when you hear the name of these people, you automatically get the idea they're barbaric, or these people may sound like they're more sophisticated. And Howard, I mean, excuse me, H.P. Lovecraft really kind of jumped on him for that later on because 
what ended up happening, he would use names that people had a different association for. So he meant one thing in his story, but everyone else reading it kind of had a different association for that name. It didn't always work out quite right. Um, but social commentary is coming, and what we're going to discuss, he had some very um, interesting things to say about society, and he said it right out. And then the last thing I want to say here is that the Tower of the Elephant was considered to be one of Howard's best works by H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I didn't really find it to be the best one we read in this in the, in the three stories we read, but yeah, that's supposed to be one of his better ones according to uh, according to, to Lovecraft. So, Josh, I'm going to quit yapping about the background, but I found that really interesting, and I, I like knowing about the the writer. And I wish we had looked into the background of Dan Simmons a little bit more, but those books were so big with so many concepts, we really didn't have time. Uh, but uh, wanted to no, John, you're right, spread you're some right. knowledge about Howard. Yeah, thanks for the background because you're t it totally works what you said about how Howard chronicled Conan's adventures, and he is an adventurer. Basically, Conan goes on so many adventures. He gets in so many situations that are nearly impossible for any civilized man. I love the language. They're all short stories, and they all pack a punch. Some are some are longer than others. Some are, are and they're all completely different. It's just the variety and the the um, it's Conan himself, the character. He he wasn't done justice in cinema, I think. So you can erase no. everything you know about no, Conan. Not at all, Josh. And I, I have to say, since you brought that up, Arnold Arnold Schwarzenegger completely misrepresented. Uh, the character of Conan. I, I, that's really harsh because I, I own that movie. I, I love that movie. I like it's just a fun movie to watch while I'm you know eating some popcorn, right? But complete mi Conan was very intelligent in Robert E. Howard stories, and he had codes that he lived by, and and um, he was a much more sophisticated character than what Hollywood has portrayed him as so far. Yeah, and and we love James Earl Jones too, but the Conan movies just again whoosh, squash them. Go into this. Basically, with with no preconceptions, and and the fact that this adventurer Conan sits here and it seems to live multiple life. I mean, he he, li he has so many experiences. Like it's like he lives multiple lifetimes because he goes across the continent and he he has so many jobs. Uh, he's a pirate. He's a king. He's a mercenary in armies. He's a uh, he's he's a plunderer. Uh, in, in, in all these different uh, different kingdoms that rise and fall, and you're like, he has no loyalties, but he does live by that code. So we see in the first three stories that we tackle here, they're all just these incredibly distinct animals that are filled with language, intense action, and Conan's thoughts and his actions toward the antagonist, and you're like, I was really drawn into it. Huge fan. So we're going to start off with the, what is it? It's the Sword on the Phoenix. Phoenix on the Sword. Up. No, it's the phoenix. It's the sword on the phoenix. <laughs> it's the phoenix on the sword. Um, the barbarian Conan. <laughs> ah, the barbarian Conan. So basically, uh, where is he? He's king, John. He's king. And you open up, and the king. And that, that's the one thing that I did remember from the movies. What is it? The, the the crown wears heavy on the brow of the king, or the head of the uh, the head of the king. So he is the king, and he basically has people that are uh, plotting his downfall right away. And the, the fun thing is, is you open up not with Conan, but you open up with his conspirators. And the Phoenix on the Sword uh, plays an important role and actually saves Conan, which is why it's the name of the short story. But the conspirators are this evil Stygian wizard. And Stygia is one of the many empires in the Conan world. And we, we're not going to talk about the Age of Hyboria, which is the actual introduction in, in this collection. And I'm glad I read The Age of Hyboria first because it actually explains the whole history of Hyboria from the fall of Atlantis to the rise of the modern European nations. So it's incredible. That thing really puts context, and it made me love the, love the world anymore. It was like early world building before maybe world building was a, a thing or a concept. I don't know, but I just know Robert Howard did it right. And so I felt... I felt like I knew this world already. So anyway, the phoenix on the sword, this Stygian wizard, he's mad because he's he's having to do the bidding of the lead conspirator. And they're Ascalante. basically... Ascalante. Yeah. I he, love the names. <laughs> how, do, how do you pronounce them? As Ascalante. Ascalante. The, 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 oh, you know, I can't remember the, the Stygian necromancer's name. Bad 
evil dude who worships yeah. mad gods. This yeah, guy was, serpent ring guy. <laughs> serpent ring guy lost his serpent ring, which is why he's that. <laughs> that sounds he's, like a kid's he story. Doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any. He doesn't have any powers. He's just he's got his little bag of tricks, but he's not a powerful wizard that everyone fears because he lost this all powerful ring, which he had you know plundered from some deep dark tomb in Stygia. So now Ascalante. Um, is is guiding the downfall of Conan. They have uh, different noblemen who are you know leading away uh, different troops from the palace to uh, to to some war because there's some skirmish with the Picts on the Bosnian marches. So basically, they, they're basically maneuvering away all the all the, any reinforcements Conan has. They're buying off the palace guards. So it's really fun because you don't see Conan. And I don't know if this is again you can jump into Conan anywhere. And, and it all works. And this is my, was my first introduction. I'm like, holy cow, Conan, you're a king. You're not, you're not this barbarian. We're not going to see him fighting per se against all these hordes. He's, he's going to be uh, fighting these conspirators. So, um, Well, that, that's what I was pointing out at the beginning was how different the, the, the original works are for Conan where – and again, I have to refer to the Hollywood movies because that was my first exposure to Conan. So I'm not going to keep going back to it. But my original thought of Conan is – <laughs> you know, and that, that's about it. Chop, hack, slash, and it was all cool and fun. And I, I just imagine that the comic books, and maybe some of the actual books that were written, were going to have a little more character than what Arnold could provide. Um, however, yeah, he starts off as a king, and and you find out right at the beginning that he's not necessarily loved by all the people anymore. He was loved when he came in and took the crown because the guy he killed and took the crown from was really evil really evil. And now the people, like any leader that comes into power, are kind of getting a little old, you know, tired of him now. And he he's he's a little distraught about the fact that he's like, ah, well, you know, the people don't really love me as much. And, um, and he know, hates being king. He hates the paperwork. Right. He's he's like, poets are writing bad things about him, and he's afraid that those words will live on, and he will just die off one day and be thought <laughs> to love. Yeah. Those poets, where do those poets, why do the poets keep coming into our stories? Why I know, are they so right? powerful? Well, we the written word of poets. Written page. It's all supreme. It lasts forever. And Conan talks about how weary it is to be a king. What, what he what he wouldn't give to take up a sword and go actually fight a foe that he could see and face, and not all these scheming politicians. So Ascalante and his Stygian uh, necromancer, they basically are worried about their dip noblemen doing their jobs, and one in particular uh, who, who they think might just <clears throat> turn you know turn his belly up and go. Um, go running to Conan and telling him the whole plot. So the Stygian necromancer goes and uh, babysits him at his his little oasis palace, wherever it is. And and it's funny because of of course it's just a plot mechanism. But guess who has that serpent ring that the Stygian priest it was stolen from him by a thief long ago. <laughs> the the little nobleman, the the little pudgy you know nobleman who's sitting here twitching his fingers waiting for the uh, the coup to happen. And um. The Stygian necromancer is mad because this guy <laughs> thinks of him as just a slave. He's so mad he ignores his whole story. He opens up. He talks about his rage and his whole story. That's where we find out he's this fallen wizard. And this this the little part this, was so funny to me. It yeah, was hilarious. He, this guy's about like the ring, and the guy's like ring. Oh yeah, I got this ring. It's a serpent ring. And he, he describes everything the necromancer had just said. And the necromancer is looking at him like you son of a, you know. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is, is the guy basically seals his own doom because he's like, "Oh, I need this little token, this little trinket. It'll it'll protect me. It's a good luck pendant." And and the and the was <laughs> like, uh, you know, he's the slave who's been oh, dismissed, yeah. not even listened to, and and right there, it's like my ring, and he attacks him, and uh, pretty much um, yeah, that was his golem goes, moment. It was berserk, and the golem that moment. That was his precious. The golem moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it was this precious, but the Gala moment is what he calls forth. He calls forth. This is Robert Howard's description of the monsters in his books is actually pretty creepy, because he gives you, you know, he gives you, you know, just enough to use your own imagination. So you see the shadow of what the necromancer calls forth, <clears throat> and it's, it's it is a shadow, and you don't get the full description until later at the the climax, and it's this thing that. You know, is 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 not of this world, and it's and as Robert Howard keeps calling them blasphemies of insanity. You know, I just love the language. Absolutely love the fact that it's not these gruesome, graphic 
descriptions. It's, it's these simple things that state that this is not of this world. You should. It would make you go insane to stare into its eyes, and and you're like, holy cow, what did they deal with? You had to be a barbarian. I mean, Conan survives in, when other people die because he can. He can, and in this story in particular, you see how he he basically one lucks out, but also uses his barbarianism and his wild instincts to actually, you know, take down these monstrosities that would, you know, burn the souls and destroy any other civilized man. Yeah, yeah, that. you know what? I absolutely I'm love glad that. You mentioned burning the soul because when he called up the monster and he 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 told it to go after Ascalante as well. And he said, before you kill Ascalante, he said, look into his eyes and blast his soul. You're right. Went, Whoa, man, this is kind of dark. Hey, 1930s, what the heck? So d did you notice, though, how the – comparing the writing, and I'm not – I'm not going to bring Dan Simmons into this because he uh -oh. he's a league uh -oh. of his own. No, no, I mean as far as the writing, di totally different league. W when I say modern writing, okay, so don't include Dan Simmons, but and we may see some of this in our upcoming book. Um, but he was able to say a lot in 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 few words, right? It kind of reminded yes. me of Tolkien, where he could describe a horrific monster without going on and on for about three paragraphs about every little feature of the monster. I didn't need to know every little feature of that monster. My imagination took over immediately. And, you know, even even with the fighting with Conan and he, you know, Conan is slaying the enemies, I'm not necessarily getting every little detail about every swing of the sword and every stab. We get a lot of that, but it, he kind of did it in a Tolkien way where it was a little more compact, but it, it had more emphasis or it had more oomph to it, if that makes sense. You're right. Anyway. I, had, I had a lot more, well, to borrow a word from Darkness. Robert Howard, vitality. The, yep. the language has a lot of vitality, and you and you realize you understand the nature of Conan and and basically what he's capable of, and and, and you're reminded of that in, in these action sequences that have so much, so much in such a short little span, and you're like, wow, you, you, he lets you use your own imagination. And our introduction to Conan actually comes when you fast forward. This this monster um, darts out of this palace, and you know it's coming for Ascalante. Because basically with the wizard, he finally has his full power, and he says, you know, blast his soul, then, then destroy him. And in a fit of, of passion, he said, and all who are with him. So that's important because Ascalante, anyone who's around him is going to get destroyed. And so you're like, uh-oh, Ascalante is going to take his little marauders to the palace, which is now virtually abandoned, and, and Conan is going to be caught in the middle of this. He and so you don't know what's going to play out, but it, it the story. This is a really short story, and so I wasn't expecting how abruptly it ended. But the finale is pretty intense because you, you knew what you know where everything's coming to with this whole setup right here. But you're introduced to Conan, you know, as a warrior. The fact he's complaining about being king, and I love the language he he envisioned or dreamed of being a king. But that's as far as his dreams extended. You know, Robert Howard's language is very rich. It's like he. It's like it is, it is, you know, what we in our own life, it's like you reach for the ultimate, and when you get there, what do you do? And it's kind of funny how, you know, he doesn't, you know, doesn't get on the soapbox and, and going on about it, but it's, it's this simple two sentences that encapsulate this whole meaning of life. You reach, you aspire for the top, and you get there, and you didn't think what you would do when you get past. So I love that. That's our introduction to Conan. He's sitting here being the weary king. And he's 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 grumbling about not going with the troops to fight on uh, the picks, and it's, it's really fun. But yeah, he we, goes. He goes. I I wanted to take the throne. I didn't really want to rule. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but then we get to it. We get to it. The conspiracy. Um, everybody's paid off. Conan is by himself, and this is you know th this whole short story is much longer than what we've described, but it, it it's in essence what what it is. He's he's about to be attacked, and even as as much of a, a bad dude as he is, the original survivor, as I call him, the original reaver and conqueror and lover. This man, he's the archetype of every alpha male you could ever want. Even as awesome as he is, <clears throat> it's he knows that when the conspirators bust through the door, and actually we can't we can't actually get to the door busting just yet, because the Phoenix on the sword, he's dreaming. And, and, and this is important in the lore of Aquilonia, which is one of the Hyborian kingdoms that he's the king of. Aquilonia is the strongest uh, kingdom. 
So he actually mounted the best throne. He's at the top of the top, which is why everybody's after him. Um, but basically, he has this vision of this of this ancient place, and he walks through this dark corridor, and he meets this ancient wizard, and we'll just call him Ancient Dead Wizard. Um, you said names have rich context and meaning, and I actually failed at remembering this guy's name. Me too. <laughs> but he, and, he basically the sage, what I called him. <laughs> let's call him the Sage because he's a good guy. Yeah. He basically. He basically is a protector of Aquilonia, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, and I feel bad that I didn't take notes on well, this. Well, this this guy was a he was another necromancer. I mean, he called himself a sage, but he was like, uh, wasn't he? Didn't he help fight against the other necromancer who just found his ring? There was some history there, long, the, long time. History ago. is yeah, he was, there. yeah he yeah he was maybe. Um, the necromancer he, for the he knew Oracle he knew Party. who that guy was anyway, and he knew he was bad news. And he didn't he wasn't going to let a wizard uh, muddy the affairs of Aquilonia or de derail it from its destiny. That was the kind of the broad picture, even if if we're kind of making up huh, the, the 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 details. So he basically said, "Here, um, I will not let the, any wizardry or any anything um, befall you." So he branded his sword with the phoenix on it, and then Conan. Woke up and he's 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 sweating because this was pretty intense. Even for his, uh, he, he's basically he's a superstitious barbarian. He's like, whoa, what was that all about? And he actually looks over at his sword and there's the phoenix on the sword. And you're like, that wasn't a dream. So he's he's kind of he's kind of taken aback, but it actually um, wakes him up and he's his barbarian instincts take over, and so he starts to prepare for battle. He doesn't know what's coming or why, but his instincts take over. So it's great because he's actually half armored up, and he comes out of that dream, and you get the whole context of that of that importance and, and why it's going to play a role at the end here. And then the doors bust down, and it's at least 20 marauders um, headed by Escalante. And yeah, hey, and Josh, it, so it sounded like this. They busted through the door, and then they went, oh, man, because <laughs> he's standing there half armored with his sword. They thought and they were going to catch him asleep. Exactly. They're like pretty much oh crap. I mean, I, I, they're basically like okay, well, what do we do? And they called it what the Robert Howard called like it. Insurance called it. Policy. <laughs> anyway, they, they basically are like frozen and I don't know how far the rep Conan's reputation is far and wide, but Ascalante, he's they they've come this far. He says attack, you know. It's this bizarre little, you know, half second of indecision and everybody's looking at each other, it's maybe a comical moment, but they do attack. And Conan, you know, he hews down. I love the word hew because that's uh, H E W, the big the big synonym for they all die. So he hews down five or six of them, seven, eight, however many he can. And I love this battle scene. It's short and tense. I don't remember anything of the details except that he he he's he gets wounded People come in and out. He hacks and slashes. It's, it's this very quick thing that's fun to read about because he essentially takes his wounds and he takes down five or six at a time, even though he's getting stabbed. And what, 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 one of those being that poet. One of those being that poet that he was lamenting that was writing bad things about him at first, and, and he could consider him you know, at least a loyal subject, or not a friend, but just a lo yeah, loyal subject. And he sees Ronaldo, and he sees Ronaldo come in, and he's going... Ronaldo, you know, and he says he basically doesn't want to hurt Ronaldo, and he That's actually right. waits until Ronaldo stabs him in the side, and then he's like, "All right, you know." And then lays that him was out. hilarious because it goes back to the fact that he's like, "Oh no, Ronaldo, he might. I can't kill him because he he can't. I don't know. He was worried about maybe another bad poem, but it was funny that he wasn't. He didn't want to kill him, and he actually shoved him away." while he's just hacking away at the other guys. He gave him like a reprieve, and then Ronaldo comes back and stabs him. But I love the language about him being a dying tiger, and he could still deal death, and he was in the corner, and he had the fire in his eyes, and you're like, man. That barbarian rage was, you know, when you, when you trap them, that's when they go all crazy. And and by the way, and I, I know I've made a lot of comments here, but you see that, is that a meme? I don't know what that is. You, you see that, uh, that idea here, it must have originated from here, but in all the video games that have come out 
in the last 20 years probably, when you have a barbarian in there, one of the superpowers of the barbarian is the barbarian rage, where he literally <laughs> has two swords or two axes and just starts hacking everything in sight. And, it, and I, I couldn't help but think about that. We can uh, thank Conan for exactly. that. Exactly. Good job, Mr. Howard. But basically, he, you know, he, he's gonna, he's, he's gonna die. He knows it, and I love that part because it says he's gonna take out as many as he wants to. He has no preconceptions and no disillusions that he's gonna survive this, which, which raises the stakes. And you're like, what? It's like, holy cow, Conan, you know, it gives you that context that he's not invisible, and you're like, whoa, all right, let's see, let's see what he can do, and if anybody comes to help him, and instead of help, he gets. The demon baboon blasphemy from Hades. This this shadow monster that was unleashed by the necromancer comes in, and then you think, okay, that'll help him. He'll, by by you know, we know that this thing is after Ascalante, and we think maybe there's going to be a bloodbath. I was anticipating a bloodbath at least, but everybody shrieks like little girls and <laughs> exits the room. And Conan's in the blood rage. He doesn't know what's going on, but everybody else did. Ascalante was at this point attacking, and that's when Ascalante, our dear friend, dear lead conspirator, gets what's coming to him, um, because if I guess, I don't know, reading this story, I knew that there's no escape, because this thing was you know on a mission. It's kind of like a heat-seeking rocket. You cannot escape it, and uh, Ascalante, mid-stride, um, is grabbed by this thing, and his his soul is blasted, and then he, uh, he limps down, and he's done for. It's this quick awful agonizing death and you're like holy cow so earlier on in the battle we didn't mention this but Conan in the first in the first uh, moments of the battle he crushes his opponent's uh, helmet with the sword with the phoenix on it and it is broken at the hilt so he basically is going on with his axe this whole time and he sees this thing and he's like okay he's not scared of it he's like I'll just take this thing out and he, he it's, it's definitely done he just basically gets the axe you know, after years of practice of throwing axes, I guess, and he and he does he throw the thing or does he just leap at it and then do the crushing death blow? I and thought, the, you know what? I can't remember after reading the other two stories. He, I thought he just swung at it. If he if he did throw it, it didn't do anything. Either way, the beast j leaps on top of him and has him on the floor, right? And it's just trying blasting to his soul out. Yeah. <laughs> and at this point, he's reaching for anything he can get, and he he finds the hilt of the sword that had the phoenix on it, which he, he broke, and he took that and he stabbed the beast in the side with it, and it actually said the thing started gushing blood. Um, but, of course, only the magic sword, only the magically enhanced sword uh, could uh, was, was capable of doing that. And um, something I've seen throughout all these Conan stories, and again, going back to even the very first movie I ever watched, a lot of things that happened to Conan... Um, you know, he gets into these bad situations, then he gets out. But there's always something fantastical that seems to help him along the way. There's always chance. Like, there's always some chance thing that happens, and he's saved. Right, for instance, um, he didn't know that necromancer or that sage that came to him in the dream and helped him. Something fantastical helped him. And you'll see in the other two stories, it's the same thing. Something fantastical helps him get out of the sticky situation, which is not a bad, um, not a bad uh, 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 plot line to go with at all. Um, but uh, he's always had some help. Man, those wizards—they're everywhere. And Conan, Thank God he grabbed the hilt of that sword. You know, Conan he runs in other directions when he meets wizards because he's like, just give me a good foe to fight with the sword. <laughs> he he he's like, blast them all. You know, because and we'll see in the next one how crazy it gets. Yeah, this thing, but I, I loved how the fact that his his superhuman strength basically couldn't even dent the monster's skull. This basically the axe couldn't couldn't do anything, and that was what scared me. It's like he put all of his strength out of a split. You know, I love the language saying it would basically split anything a tree in half. Uh, we don't need to be super graphic because he, he has unimaginable strength, and that's when you get kind of scared because when the thing's blasting his soul, Conan's like, oh, my goodness, he's going insane. And he, he gets up or he, he drags the thing with him. The thing's still clawing on him, but he still manages to walk or to crawl and, and, and uh, avert his gaze from the monster. So, again, the, the, his, the battle is super short, so you have to take every little bit of what you're given and say he was in a tough spot, and I just love that. 
he's like, if you can imagine, like, oh, don't look at the thing, don't look at the thing, and, get, and reach for anything and try something else before you do go insane. And he does, luckily, he lucked out and found the sword. And he, uh, it would, he dealt the death blow. And then the thing starts to melt, and the thing starts to go away. And then everyone busts into the room, all the, the lovely, tough senators and all the women of the court, whoever's left, you know, they, no one could have helped him. And he just totally lucked out. And we find out from one of the uh, Ishtar that you knows it's Mithra. Is that their god? Is it Mithra? Or myth? I'm thinking of Mithril from Lord of the Rings. But basically, we'll get the gods straight. One of the Alkalites, he, he tells Conan um, not to talk about what he saw with uh, the ancient sage because it's a ghost, uh, closely guarded secret. Because Conan is telling his crazy story of what happened. No one, everybody thinks he's touched in the head. But we yeah, find yeah. out it's a, a, a closely guarded secret of where this place that he visited in his dream it actually exists and it's part of their you know their whole their whole cult or whatever. So Conan's like, I can't believe this. And that's pretty much the end of the story. And it's awesome. The whole thing about how, you know, mythicism and about barbarianism and how it all meshes together with politics. So great introduction in the Phoenix on the Sword. And I absolutely loved it. Give it four out of five stars because I would have liked to maybe seen a little bit more uh, action, but you know what? The next the action comes in the next one. But that Art. was his very first story, right? That was Howard's. I I don't know that. I what I couldn't tell about this book is if this this collaboration had actually been reordered by the fans, like I discussed at the beginning, right. or if that was actually his very first one. But it was short enough and simple enough that it could have been. I mean, when we get into the Scarlet Tower, you can see that's definitely not his very first one. Now the Scarlet Tower, I love the the continuity that it brings, and we're gonna jump right oh, into the it. Scarlet Citadel. I'm sorry, not the tower. The Elephant Tower, Scarlet Citadel. John, yeah, you're gonna keep go. the story the story name straight. I'm gonna. I will I'm not. Keep, <laughs> I'm gonna keep the uh, the narrative straight. But I love the continuity in the Scarlet Citadel because you meet Sotha. I call him Sotha. Starts with the T. Silent T. I called he, him Sathaman, Satha, Sathalante, whatever he was in that particular paragraph. Super evil dude that you actually think can defeat Conan and are scared of because Howard makes you understand the depth of his evilness. But it doesn't open up with with him. It opens up with Conan's vanquished armies. So it's it's really cool to see Conan at the top of his game, King of Aquilonia, and in the opening of the Scarlet Citadel, he goes out to help um, one of the neighboring nations. There's Ophir and Koth, and I think Ophir is his sister nation state that he's going uh, to help defeat Koth, um, the Koth army that has marched on the border. So it's just a border skirmish. He takes 5,000 soldiers, but you open up with the story they're all vanquished. Why? Because of betrayal. Betrayal of the Ophirian king. He, he teams up with the Cothian king, and they do have real names, Almerus and Stravinus. And you can, you know, you can pick whichever um, king they are, whichever nation. It is important, but I want to get to the crux of what's going on here. Conan is the last sole survivor, and I love the opening scene because people want to kill him. They don't want to leave him alive. There's no quarter in this age of Hyboria. You know, this, this is a brutal era, but there's a stack of horses and dead bodies, so there's like this wall behind Conan, and you open up to this scene where he's, he's in his own little semi kind of protected area, and he is, again, the savage tiger, the savage wolf, who is going to take down every last man. Let them come. He'll go down to fighting. That's the way he's lived. That's the way he's going to die, and so it's awesome. He's, he's in his black male armor. And everyone's livid. I mean, people are foaming at the teeth because he has slaughtered all the best swordsmen. They're laying right at his feet. And, he, and I'm just laughing. I'm like, this is so awesome. And Stravenus and Almerus come up, the two kings, with this evil, evil figure, um, the wizard Sotha, in them, between them. And he's he's basically like, come, come, wizard. I will – basically, the wizard basically walks off – comes off his horse, walks up to him and says, I give you life. So you're like, oh. Conan will survive, obviously, but here's how it happens. This this wizard that everyone's afraid of walks right up to him. This no one wants to even touch this guy's robes. Super the wizard evil. with like some time shifting shrike power. <laughs> Super evil dude. I wouldn't be surprised. But I love the scene. The scene how what happens because Conan, you know, you see actually okay he's gonna live, but Conan's like when the wizard said, "I give you life." 
Conan says, I give you death, wizard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes to strike yes. him down. Yeah. And the wizard does uh, an impossible number, which I found improbable. And he, uh, he he touches him with the ring, which has you know a little magic sleeping potion. So Conan goes down, and he's uh he's out for the count. And everyone's like, whoa! I mean, it just adds to the legend of Sothan, seemingly in- invincible wizard. So he's captured, and his kingdom is going to fall. And they take him to Ophir. I should know which kingdom it is in. Yeah. They 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 took him to Strabonus or Strabonus, whatever his name is. They took him to his capital, and I can't remember the name of the city either. But well, I don't hey, know if it's Ophir or Koth, but can I can I jump in right here? The, this scene when they're dragging him on the cart and he's completely paralyzed. I thought um I thought it really was a uh, a high point in the story in the character development because this is a really short story. There's not a lot of time to flesh out these characters, but Conan's laying on the cart. He's paralyzed. There's the, in the story. There's nothing he can do. He's being dragged off to this other city, and um, he has he has a couple moments of doubt. Right. Um, he he's laying there thinking back on uh, what it meant to be king. He's thinking about you know all the beautiful women he had. He's thinking about his armies, and he's just kind of letting his mind wander a little bit. And I I like the way Howard did it, right? It added a little bit of realism to Conan. It made him feel more three dimensional than he really already felt, right? Because he he's a king, he's a barbarian, he's got this code he lives by, but he cares a little bit, and he's he's just thinking back on all of these things because he he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. That and, is super uh, important. I just wanted to make that note. It was really it was really quick, but it was really well done. And it's super important, John, because he actually doesn't want his kingdom to fall to these traitors, to these um, people. Um, they they basically right after that you find out that they're not gonna just off him. They're gonna make him an offer. Um, and I don't know the politics of the era, but basically, he's, well, this is this is a commentary on politics. I'm sorry, I I interrupted there. I'll let you no, continue. But no, this yeah. is commentary on politics because, um, yeah, they they say to him, hey, listen, we basically want to give you this money, and you're gonna sell you're gonna sell out your kingdom, and um, this you know again, this is written in the 1930s, so we're coming off the Great Depression. Um, so you can just imagine the the anger towards wealthy people that there might have been in the country at the time, and the politics. I mean, I mean, think about it. It was it was bad enough for the United States in the last you know what five six years we've gone through, or a little bit of an economic depression. But back then it was even worse. And let's see what happens here. They they start talking about uh, sell out, sell out your kingdom, and he says, "No, I will not sell out my kingdom." And he says, "I'm a barbarian." And I thought, and I started laughing when he said that because I thought, I, I just in my head, I'm picturing Strabonus and and Satha looking at him and going, "Yeah, we know. That's why we thought you might sell out your kingdom because you're a <laughs> barbarian. Okay, that's why we're talking to you about this." But in fact, the commentary here is that that the barbarian had more of a code than these other people of power, and you can draw your own conclusions from that. But I I just think there was. I, I really feel like that was social commentary, right out in the open. And he does spit in their face, and for his efforts, he is thrown in the dungeons. This is these are no no normal dungeons, John. This is below the Scarlet Citadel, hence the name of the actual short story. And there's there's double barred doors, there's grills that only open from the outside. Um, it's basically this dark place that light eats up, and all the people, all the jailers are even nervous when they chain. Conan up. So even with this superhuman strength, he comes to where he has his doubts. Should he have taken the offer from them? But then he knows his code. Right, but that's instincts. more of that realism. He had those self doubts. Yes, I loved it. Yes. I mean, just just little just little tidbits Howard threw in the story that makes made him feel more real. real. Right. It makes him more real. You're right. But he can't escape. He's jailed up, and and, and this place is. You feel how the horror of this place, and you get a little bit more tidbits about. How ancient it, it is when Conan meets someone in the in the tombs below the Scarlet Citadel, and he knows he wasn't left here just for a uh, just for confinement. He's there f- for a certain doom, and it's awesome because an 80 foot snake, a snake that dwarfs all his other other ideas of what a snake is, actually comes through the darkness, and he stands like a stone statue. I mean, again, Conan. The, the, the characterization of him and basically why he does, how he does it, that's what makes him fun. Some people may think he's a shallow character and that's far from it. You found out right here that he saves himself by standing like a, a statue 
um, of bronze, and this snake comes inches from his face. And instead of taking that last gambit to try to uh, crush its skull, he stands still. He might make it, but he knows he's doubtful. He can move as fast as the snake. And the only thing that saves him, he's chained to the wall, is when the door opens to the dungeon and the snake um, slithers off. Again, more chance. <laughs> it's it's more chance. You're right. You're right. The, the story is filled with it, and I love this because it's one of the people that Conan and all his adventurers has hurt. And it's and, and this guy comes and he um, dangles the uh, the key chain in front of Conan and says, "You know, you you, you remember me? You're a pirate. You destroyed my kingdom." So it's this guy that he never really met, but that um, felt Conan's. Uh, Plundering and um, the ravaging. By, by, by the way, this story had terrible racial sensitivity. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. You're right. <laughs> so the guy, the guy has the keys. He's dangling them, and then Conan freezes, and he he watches as the snake comes back, and he finds his prey and sees that the, the snake really is quicker than he could have been, and he snatches the guy away, and the keys just fall right in front of his feet because the guy is like. And the sword. Across the dungeon <laughs> and the <back>. torch. <laughs> so basically the guy's gone. He's dragged away. Conan quickly grabs the keys, and he can't get out, though, because the grill, the second barrier, which every monster in that pit has, has thrown itself against, it's, it's locked from the outside. He's like, ah! And then one of the evil torturers comes, and there's a torturer who came looking for his keys, and Conan, he, he hacks at him, and he kills him. And he's like... He can't get out though, because the guy the guy was uh, was never gonna let him out, and the key wouldn't work. So Conan, that's important that that part right there. But Conan goes to the long dark tunnels. Well, that that was Conan's Indiana Jones moment right there, right? The guy latches it and he's ha ha ha, he's laughing at him, you know, and that's and that's the point, you know, when the guy's swinging the sword at Indiana Jones, he just rolls his eyes and pulls out his gun and shoots him, and this guy's laughing at him on the other side, and Conan takes the sword and's like, eh, whatever, and he just <laughs> slays him. That was. And then and he that just guy walks off, it. whatever, can't get out that way. <laughs> that dude was almost as evil as Sotha. I mean, these guys flay people and do all kinds of horrible things. And Conan, he goes into the deep, dark tunnel. And this is a scary place, John. And, and this is the HP Lovecraft uh, territory with all these yes. monsters. Conan, Conan hears this uh, crying, this wailing of a woman. And when he goes to investigate, it's this malformed octopus jelly. Frog faced monster that makes these inhuman noises and it literally again blasts his soul. He he just he's terrified. His barbarian instincts just make him freak out and thinking this thing should not be of this earth. And he starts to get an idea of he's in an insanity asylum. And he runs back, trips over something, and that's when his torch goes out. He had a single torch. And he's he's and I couldn't imagine even being in his shoes because he's crawling through the dark. He's going through the dark at this point, and you're like, holy cow. And he, he comes upon his instincts stop him. I mean, the guy's got instincts like nobody's business, apparently, because he stops at the precipice of a well, and he, he can barely touch the other side with the sword. He's like, I'm not going to jump this thing. And then he feels this invisible evil come behind him. And he, he, you know, people usually in horror stories would flip out and go running, and they wouldn't make it. But Conan, by the skin of his teeth, turns tail, and he feels the hot breath on his back, and you're like, holy cow, this guy's got nerves of steel. So We this never really did get a good description of what that thing was. Yeah. yeah that it's that just, thing. I mean, it was just creepy. It's it's this invisible vicinity, and you're like, ugh. I, you don't even want to think about it. You're just like, run, Conan, run. That's what I'm doing the whole time. Yeah, you really have to... You, if you're listening and you haven't read the story, you really have to just read this part to understand how dark and creepy it really is. This book got really, really creepy in this part. And again, another testament to, to Robert E. Howard's writing. Short, short, t uh, tight writing, and you're like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to Conan? How is he going to get out of here? Because it made it pretty clear that this thing was near the bowel of Hades. How is he really going to survive? And he comes across a jail cell, jail cell, a jail cell, a jail cell. <laughs> that thing has a important person, and this person, his uh, his only uh, jailer is a plant that's sucking the life out of him. It's this evil plant. And you're like, holy cow, what's going to come out of the darkness next? Because this guy's basically like a Venus flytrap from Hades, and this thing is sucking the life out of him. And Conan, very H.G. Wellsian, very, very. 
Conan feels sorry for the guy. You know, the guy has a soft spot, and he hacks this plant from the roots, and the thing falls limp, and it, it saves the man. And it, this turns out to be a very good thing because the wizard, um, Pilus, P.S. Pilus, uh, P uh, yeah, it was something like that. Important man. He's a wizard. Yeah. Sage yes. number two. He saw this arch enemy. Arch enemy for ten years being sucked that his soul is being sucked by this evil plant for ten years. Which which he said the plant had its roots literally in hell. He right? did. He said he said, I'm glad you didn't hack down much further because you might not have liked what you found clinging to the roots below. Exactly. Your sword wouldn't have survived it. So you're just flipping out. And but now we got Sotha's arch enemy. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? That's the basic concept here. Even though Conan has an uneasy feeling about him. Um, and Conan, uh, I think before, right before this, he realized that the main corridor was the was the snakes, the 80-foot snakes uh, hunting ground. So that's why all these other obscenities didn't just come out and kill Conan outright because you got a glimpse of all these other things lurking and staring at him. So it, it got really creepy. But the, the snake was the oldest of Sotha's pets. And the pet comes back. But thank goodness for Pylos, because Pylos, he basically d tells Conan that the reptile, the, the what do you call it, the, the scaled people, he's talking about the snake, can see my true nature. And um, obviously his true nature is something Conan doesn't want to see. So th the, s the snake turns tail, because Con Conan is ready to die right there. He's ready to take make one last thrust at the snake, but Pylos actually scares the thing away, which is another awesome moment. They get back to the opening of the pits, and, and uh, Pylos brings back to life the evil torturer to open the grill gate. And Conan's just, I mean, the dude literally, he's holding it together, but this whole thing is something, again, that a civilized man, as he calls them, or someone with less nerves would have just gone insane. He's just, he wants out, and he, 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 he squeezes past this, this uh, dead automaton who opened the gate for them, and he's finally out. But he, he's kind of like, all right, I can't, he had one moment, to, to say, let me kill this sorcerer and get away from this creep. But thank goodness he doesn't, because we find out that his kingdom is through a crystal ball that the sorcerer shows him. His kingdom is under siege. Uh, Tamir is the capital. Shamir is the, is the city that they have to sack to, to over, overthrow Aquilonia. So all the politics are going on. All the nobles have gone back to their fiefdoms, and Conan's in a rage. He's gone through this, this bizarre hell. And he's, he's now back in Conan mode saying, there's no way I can save my kingdom. And uh, Pylos is like, yeah, man, here's a flying bat. <laughs> and they go to the top of the Or whatever that thing was. Oh, oh hey, hey, can we back up real quick? Because we forgot yeah. to mention that the Conan, the, the, the whole point of the name of this story, the Scarlet Citadel, is that the Scarlet Citadel was built on top of these pits that Conan found himself in. So that that's the point of the story. You don't really ever go into the Scarlet Citadel, but <clears throat> apparently there was another city that had been built on top of that area, and they abandoned the city because they had built these tunnels below the, the, the palace, and they found these pits. They, they broke a wall down and stumbled into these pits, and somebody went down there and never came back, and there were some very horrible things they were hearing come out of there. And then, of course, that's exactly where Sotha wanted to build his citadel is right on top of these pits, obviously, because he had direct connection with hell or whatever it is he, he was up to. So anyway, just filling in some blanks there. No, so, yeah, right. the crazy bat, winged, dark no, we had, we, we, I, I, dragon I, I creature. Shouldn't have, I shouldn't have glazed over Sotha's history. He was born of a, um, of a black devil that came and basically did what he wanted to with the human woman. So he, he, was, he was of the union of, of a truly, truly nefarious demon. So he, he was only half human. But uh, Pylos was full human, even though he was centuries old and he could... He could basically battle Sotha. You know, um, we'll find out later that he can battle him. And you know what? The, we're going to actually wrap up with the Scarlet Citadel because there's a lot of good stuff here left um, to see how Conan. Remember, he, his army was decimated at the beginning. He's he basically has no all his kingdom is scattered. People are fickle. You talked about in one of the other stories how people would turn on Conan who. They were basically like, oh, the good old days, because people are very fickle. So we're going to end with this story. And so let's get to the, the main battle. The bat is um, able to take Conan to his kingdom. You find out that his sh Shamar is holding its own, but the Aquilonians there have, have no disillusionment that they'll survive a third day. 
because they're, the river is under siege. They have barges there, and their whole army of 40,000, a whole host of the best Shemai archers and everyone else are laying, are laying siege to it, and they're, and they're going to fall. And Aquilonia has a, a new king. He's claimed the throne. Um, basically, the barbarian, our king barbarian Conan, has given the city to a, a faithful uh, what are they called? They're like they're like the special guard. They're like the special ops of that era, and they 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 have the city under protection. Tamir, the sister city of the capital. But the, the, then this prince, this butcher, that is like basically working with Stravinus the, and the other traitors. He's going to become a mock king, and they're going to outright annex Aquilonia. There's just all these politics involved, and you're like, holy cow! And they describe all that. They describe how this butcher, after the the special ops forces actually. Um, you know, they have to concede that he has the rightful authority. They basically maneuver the whole political body. This thing, again, is, is told in short order, but it makes sense. It's incredibly well written. You're like, holy cow, where did this come from? You're, you're reading this mystical story about Conan surviving in, in, in this pit, and it comes back to this political, you know, whole web. And you're like, holy cow, what's happening? But it's, it's well done. And this butcher is laughing at people from the parapets up in his kingdom, and you think all is lost. And then here comes Conan on the bat, <laughs> and people are their mouths are just gaping. And uh, this prince, he's like, "Holy cow!" And he leaps after Conan. And I love how Howard writes this because he's such a bad dude. This prince is just so mean. He doesn't respect any human life. He's he's just. He's a horrible person, and so he gets his comeuppance. Conan jumps off the bat, and he rolls onto the parapet. And, and the dude, he, he's shocked, and then he's like, I'm not giving all this up. And he, and he comes at Conan, and in, in one swift move, he parries his blow, and he picks him up over his head, and he says, go, to, go back to hell, I think. <laughs> I don't remember. I just remember the, the tossing of the body over the side. <laughs> Which was awesome. 150 feet and he's done. So you have this meteoric rise of this of this butcher and this dictator, and you think, wow, this is bad news. The two cities under attack, and Conan just dispatches the one super easy. It was just comical. It was very comical. See you, Prince. So now we uh we come to Shamir. Uh, he, Conan, you find out how Conan um helps save the city, but you have this host of 40,000. And you have uh, the third morning, and basically the Shamir defenders consign their souls to, to uh, their god. And you're like, oh, man, this is bad. And in the distance, you see the, out, the outriders from that host army. They're being harried, and they're being pushed back. And you see Conan with his little ragtag army come up. And then Satha, our evil wizard, is so mad. He knows... He's he's bewildered. Everyone everyone is is basically shaken by this this figure who should have been dead. You know, King, King Conan can't die, and Sotha knows it's this other wizard, and he curses not killing him earlier. But this is awesome, John. The part where the armies converge and the shift of momentum. There's a number of shifts of momentum. I love how Howard writes it. Right? I mean, you have the the big battle, the big clashing, and then the and then we'll get to the fact where even though that you know the the battle hangs, you know, in the balance of these few key points. Still, they're being overwhelmed. So Conan's got to take down their leaders. So we're not gonna we're gonna talk about I guess step by step. That momentum first happens when the Shemai archers from the invaders. They're the best of the best. They were born as archers. So I love the fact that hey, Shemites can't be out out you know out archered or out. <laughs> Uh, bow and arrow, whatever you want to call it. It, the, it, it was a convenient plot piece that what, Conan what? would bring the, you know, fewer... The Bosonian archers? He basically brought the 300, you know, and, <laughs> and the Persians could not defeat them for a long time, but it, that's who he brought. <clears throat> they started wasting a significant portion of of Satha's army and Strabonus's army, Um but, you know, I, I forget some of the details because my head was still spinning from all of the polit politics, the, the web that he weaved in about three paragraphs right, um, right. of politics. But as I remember, they're defeating a significant portion of the army. They're driving them back into the river. They do end up breaking into the city, but the people in the city fight back. So all that is going on. But Conan goes directly after Satha. 
it, and, and I don't know if I missed something there or not, but I just remember him charging directly after Satha. Now that's at the end of the battle. You, you're, you're jumping past all the awesome conveniences. I love how you describe the 300. So let's talk about the 300 real quick because that that was cool. That's Conan being being the alpha male, being this king that over the course of a night he rallied together. He conscripted all these people across the countryside. He told the nobles come you know come back. And so he has this ragtag army. So just the quick the quick breakout. I thought you'd love this part. Just being an army captain, I thought you would eat this stuff up, and I and I and I loved it because it, again it was a direct counterpoint to the beginning where he was wiped out. His five thousand soldiers all died in the beginning, and so he's he's coming back. And you're thinking this might be part two. So I just for me that struck home. How is he going to defeat them? So the Bosonian archers out out archered the Shemites, and then the pikemen, the Gunderman pikemen, again loved the world, and that's why I remember all these different factions. The Gunderman pikemen routed the infantry um, on the other side, and then the cavalry from the, the invading and the invaders um, basically they did not want to go. But uh, Satha was so mad, he said, um, "Strike!" Sinjur, or Stravinus was foaming at the mouth. They were all mad. How could this happen, right? Victory was snatched from them, and uh, Conan and all the other cavalry. They charged, and they, they obliterated their cavalry and made a wedge. And you remember in the beginning, the wedge, that Conan, it was like this last hurrah, this last gambit. He did the same thing. He did a char charging uh, cavalry with a wedge through their formation, and then it enveloped him in the first battle and killed everyone. He's doing the same thing. You're like, holy cow. But this this go-around, he's got you know the, the he's got basically the, the folks from Shamar. He's got the... Uh, the balance of power when he actually does strike down Almerus or Stravinus, whichever king, and so that's when everyone thinks that this guy is invincible. He makes he makes a headlong charge. He gets separated from from that wedge of cavalry, and he's by himself again. So it's there's a lot of parallels, and that's yeah, what I noticed. This is the part where he charges straight at Strabonus, right? Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of parallels himself, from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, and he, he he cleaves his skull. <laughs> And it's so it's it's what it's what should have happened in the first battle, and the parallels I'm talking about is that he's alone. He was alone in the beginning. He's separated from his 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 uh, cavalry at the second part, but he he uh, he he strikes true right, and he wins. And that's the decisive point where the morale of the invaders goes out. So I love this part. That's why I didn't want to glaze over because it's like wow, Robert what? Howard just plays on your expectations and he. And it's just so well done. The, the battle got a little confusing to me, though. I, I, I enjoyed it. It was <clears throat> it was great action, and he described a lot about the the distances between the archers and the and the charging infantry. And once they got 500 meters out, you know, they they started shooting their arrows at them. And he had a lot of good detail. I was just having a difficult time picturing what was going on in my head. So I mean, I, I could picture the action well enough. I, I got you know got all the ideas that Conan had. Charged in and then charged straight at Sabonis, and but I, I was having a difficult time picturing where the forces were being positioned on the battlefield, and so that whole scene was a bit of a blur to me. Just um, think, think, starship troopers in Hyboria. You have masses and masses of invaders. Exactly. It was. I love the language. It's like molten gold um, army just flowing over the land. It was like this uninterrupted mass. So it's like think of those as the. Uh, the bugs, and we gotta destroy them. You know, just go out, you know, kill them all. So it was, it was pretty cool. I loved. But then, yeah, if you could say that in, in a Casper Van Dien voice, I would love to hear it. Kill them, kill them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, man, good old cat. That was, that was, but man, that was when he was at the top of his game, man. Starship Troopers <laughs> won. It went downhill from there, man, for real. Uh, <laughs> So basically, Conan routes this invading force that's literally five times or ten times the size of his army, but everything happens. The barges that created this bridge across the river, I love this, when he does actually face Sotha, which again, you're like, Conan, come on, in the beginning, he, he basically tapped you, he, he, did, he did a ninja move and took you down. Why are you chasing him by yourself? So... For me, talking on the podcast about this makes me see one for one these incredible parallels that Howard made um, with the beginning of his story, but everything goes in Conan's favor this time. Everything is the exact opposite. So that's why, for me, this is one of my favorite stories in the Conan canon. 
So he's just so the the barges start to are cut loose, and Conan's jumping across each one like ice drifts that are separating because it used to be a bridge. Sotha makes it across. He's like, ha ha. He's getting away, chopping down everybody just to get away, trying to preserve himself. And Conan's in a blood rage, and he actually makes it across. But he can't – and it's great because they, they go from the battle, and they travel and travel. So this is where he gets alone with Sotha, away from any reinforcements. And this is where I'm freaking out, like, what's going to happen? And, and, and here comes Pylos, our wizard friend, as an eagle. And, and Conan can't catch uh, Sotha because he's on this crazy – Demon horse. It's, it's going way faster than he possibly can go. Just can't do it, man. And and I love it because the end is as swift and as quick as the first story, the the Phoenix on the Sword, because Sotha. But much is, funnier. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty funny. It, it is pretty. Yes, funny. because the eagle knocks him off the horse, and Conan is upon the sorcerer by the time he can really recover, and then what I thought was. And I'm I'm not going to say the word I want to, but a very awesome moment when Conan reins his horse and leaps off, and you just picture this 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 you know bulking warrior with a sword drawn, just walking at the necromancer, and he's looking at him like, "Better stay back from me." You know what I did last time? And Conan's going, "I'm coming to kill you." I mean, he chops yeah, his head off. He just chops his head off. But the book was so graphic here about the head flying through the air and the blood spurting from the neck and all this other you know really graphic stuff, and. Uh, and then the body standing there going, "Hey, where'd my head go?" You know, and the head's laying in the grass, looking up at him like, you know. But the best part was when the eagle picked up the head and flew off with it. When, when he, and then and then the body goes running off in the woods towards the eagle, just trying to get its head back. It was it was hilarious. It was hilarious. And it, it was kind of horrific, but it was hilarious. See, you described it. Do I love to laugh, or am I afraid? Because soft the. Right. Basically, he threw some alchemy at him, some homemade bombs that mer narrowly missed right. Conan because he could have just gone into flames and been incinerated like that with this evil who voodoo magic. And you're like, holy cow, watch out. That's why I'm still scared this whole time. Didn't know whether to laugh or whether 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 to be, be horrified at this whole scene because Sotha said, "If you cut me into little bits, I'll come back and haunt you." And I'm like, holy cow, this dude's evil. <laughs> and 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 his eyes don't. Um, he's basically still alive, even headless. And and thank goodness for Pilots, he takes his evil head and says, Whew, yeah, you deal with him, that guy, okay? You take him. And yes, body, run that way. And Conan basically says, ah, to, to heck with these wizards, you know, I, I'm out of here. Let, give me a good glass of wine or, or a jug of wine. Conan would never say glass of wine. He said, give me some good wine and be, be gone with these, these wizards. And that was what was funny about it. He's like, thank goodness. I never care to see Pilos or Pilos again. So yeah, that was and then the and then end of story. He goes victory, and uh, and then <laughs> and then it's over. But hey, I know I know we we're kind of out of time really to talk about the Tower of the Elephant. But I do want to say this: after reading the Tower of the Elephant, and uh, we'll just consider that uh, we goaded the listener or the reader into reading a, an extra story. <laughs> we we'll read, no, we'll pick that up next time. Our next Conan segment. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, tracking. Um, but that, the Tower of the Elephant, while it was one of H.P. Lovecraft's favorites, from what I learned at the beginning of the, you know, the beginning notes of the book, I did not think that it was as good as the Scarlet Citadel. The Scarlet Citadel had more character development. I uh, made Conan feel more three dimensional. There was self doubt. There was what I thought was political commentary, social commentary. There was a lot of stuff crammed into that story. The Tower of the Elephant was a more simple story, just like the Phoenix on the Sword was. A little more complicated, but I, I think the Scarlet Letter is the better of the three that we read. Yeah, the Scarlet Letter where they... Uh, Not the they, Scarlet they said, Letter, the Scarlet Letter. They said Conan was a witch. Never mind, yeah. yeah I'm <laughs> the witch. The Scarlet... The witch. Yeah, and that... <laughs> I don't, We're just making up story names. We left out the part when he had the A carved in his chest. But he's like, Psh, that's nothing but a thing. Bring it on. <laughs> Keep carving. No, Scarlet but, Citadel. Man, where is my mind today? We're going to make Thinking up... Thinking of those terrible moms. She was a terrible mom, too, wasn't she? She was a... Was, <laughs> she was... Yeah, no. She, she wasn't. She was a good mom. It was a crazy mob. It was the mob. You're right. It was, it was the preacher that was terrible, not not her. Uh, John, John that wouldn't own up to his sin. No, we're going to create new Conan stories. We're going to write fan fiction... <laughs> no, that would be awesome. We'd we'd probably mess that up or 
or do something crazy that's not Conan-esque. But Conan is going to be a regular staple here on the Reign of Books podcast because he is the original survivor, the original reaver, the original conqueror, and the man can get out of anything. He's classic, and I love to read his stories. We're going to sit here and get all of Robert E. Howard's original work in, and we're going to read Robert Jordan. He did Conan stories, among, among, among other famous authors. And that leads us to our next book, John. Next week on the Reign of Books podcast, we are going to step into a huge established community of fans who have already read, it, read the seminal fantasy series from the 90s that just concluded this year, I believe. It is none other than Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. So book one, Eye of the World, we'll read the first part of that. And we will eventually conclude within the next decade on the <laughs> podcast. We'll, we'll read it sooner sooner rather than later, but we will have the whole series, and we hope fans of the book love or like what we do with this. And we uh, we would like you to join us. And get, There's already a well-established community, as I found out. I'll give a shout-out to Dragon Mount. Uh, I hope I got that community name right. But Dragon Mount is a whole established community, and they do similar things, commentary on the books, and I'm excited about that. That's going to be our our, um, our first big series uh, that we're gonna that we're gonna eventually cover the entirety of. But thank you everyone for joining us on the Rainy Book Podcast. You can catch all the news headlines, and you can catch some of the show notes and our commentary on the first two short stories to Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian. We'll catch you next time on the Rain of Books podcast. Check us out, rainofbooks.com. See you, John. Have a great weekend. Take care. <laughs>